In this video today, I want to go over a very brief history of the use of structural steel in buildings and bridges. We'll go through some examples in the United States and then uh, how that's reflected here in structural steel construction in New Zealand. Now, um, some of the earliest versions we have here uh, come from both Chicago and New York. So on the left, we see the Home Insurance Building. Uh, which was designed by William LeBaron Jenny in 1884. And this is considered the world's first skyscraper. And then um, a few years later, uh, New York's first skyscraper, which is the Tower Building, designed by Bradford Gilbert, um, was also there. So the reason that these structures became uh, rather famous and, you know, home insurance building was 12 stories and the Tower Building was 11, um, at the time, the late 19th century, these were uh, enormously tall buildings. Uh, the only other structures in the world at the time which uh, were taller than this would have been the Great Pyramids of Giza and the um, Eiffel Tower, uh, which was you know, built, uh, again, around the same time. Now, one of the reasons why structures didn't go much taller than this and why structural steel became a attractive um, construction method was because as you go up, um, and, you know, the material which was used at the time, which is masonry, um, you have a bit of a problem. So we've got a, a little bit of an example here. Uh, now, the thing to keep in mind is that, you know, as we uh, stack more masonry on, well, it's going to, it, each of those blocks has its own weight. And so in order to keep the wall from uh, compressing and breaking under its own weight, we need to keep uh, the stress of the masonry, which is this sigma masonry, which is just simply the force over the cross-sectional area of the masonry wall, uh, less than its allowable stress. And so just as a quick visual here, you can see, you know, each of those little masonry blocks has its own weight, which I've uh, delineated as a, um, you know, little arrow here, a uh, gray arrow. And then, you know, the uh, weight, uh, the pressure on that wall, I've got as these red arrows. Well, if we go taller, well, all that's going to do is just add more pressure onto um, the wall. And so say we were already, in, you know, in that first two courses, say that we had uh, already hit our allowable stress. Well, uh, the only way that we can keep our allowable stress lower with this more force is to increase the area. And so that means that our walls get thicker. Um, and this means that as you go taller and taller and taller, uh, your bottom stories get really thick. So a good example of that is the Washington Monument in Washington, D.C., where uh, this is an obelisk, and it's primarily uh, there just as a monument with a, a staircase in the center. But you can see on the right, I've got a cross-section here where I've colored in in blue um, the exterior wall. And as you see, as you come down the structure, the walls get very, very thick until uh, really at the base, uh, because it's carrying all the weight of the masonry above it, um, the, there's really only enough room uh, in that very large structure just for the stairwell. Now, um, that's okay for a freestanding monument, but if you are in a, uh, an office building, well, it means that your bottom stories have, you know, two, three meter thick walls with tiny windows. You don't have a lot of retail or office space, which you can rent. They're kind of terrible spaces to be in. And that's why these early structures um, decided to go towards a uh, skeletal steel frame in order to open up the space. So you can see a, an early construction photo of that type of construction. Um, and you can see just relatively how uh, open everything is. Now, for those of us uh, living in the 21st century, we go like, of course, all buildings are built this way. We think about how uh, monumental and innovative that was uh, in the late 19th century. Now, uh, one of the reasons why steel is uh, useful for this is that it has a very high stiffness. And so, you know, uh, so it's got a good strength for, you know, the, the columns for the axial load, but the stiffness allows longer spans for the beams um, in for longer base spacing relative to say like a, a timber wood. And so again, that just helps to open up the space, uh, make it a bit more uh, open and airy, uh, there's more space to uh, rent out as the landlord and then as a tenant or an occupier of the building, it's just a nicer space to be in. 
Um, now, one of the reasons why we didn't see this uh, before the 19th century was because it was only around this time when, uh, say, the Bessemer steel uh, process came into place. And so the production of steel and high quality steel was finally becoming cheap enough that you could use it uh, at sort of the scale of a building instead of at the scale of, uh, of a tool, like uh, an axe or a hammer. Um, one of the other reasons that uh, you will see with these older buildings that are always wrapped in masonry is that you need a fireproof steel. It does lose its strength during a fire, and particularly in the late 19th century and uh, throughout the 19th century, there are many large fires in these big cities, you know, buildings packed closely together, uh, lots of coal and wood-burning stoves. Um, so fires were common, so you've got to protect that. And it was only when they really sort of figured out fireproofing, convinced uh, the respective cities of Chicago and New York uh, that their structures were going to be okay in a fire, that uh, the building departments allowed them to do that. And as I said, a lot of that fireproofing uh, is done with masonry. You know, that makes some intuitive sense. You know, fireplaces are made of masonry because they, uh, you know, have poor thermal con um, convection through there, and so they sort of keep that heat in, and uh, that's really good also for uh, keeping fire away from your steel. So if we go back to those buildings, you can kind of see now some of the, um, you know, classic use cases uh, of it. So on the home insurance building, you can see the short building uh, to the upper right, where, you know, everything just looks a bit shorter and stockier, and you got big thick windows, and you can see sort of the depth of the windows on that, of just how much deeper they have to be in order to get that masonry wall, while you've got a building which is easily twice the height, uh, much more open and airy. Now, the tower building um, is, a, is an interesting case history there, because uh, you can see, given its height, it's actually on a very narrow uh, section of land, and so uh, the shorter buildings either side aren't owned by the uh, same um, owner. And so uh, it was originally bought by a steel ma uh, by a silk magnate, so someone made all of his money uh, trading silks overseas, and he wanted to get into real estate, but he had this very narrow lot, and so he engaged an architect by the name of Bradford Gilbert, who had built a lot of bridges and thought, well, I'll just build a bridge vertically instead of horizontally. And so uh, he convinced uh, the city to do this. There was a lot of pushback. People didn't think it was going to work. In fact, uh, in 1889, while the last few stories uh, were still being completed, a hurricane came through New York. And so he actually climbed up to the top of the building and put a, a lead weight on a rope there to see if it was moving around, uh, climbed down. The building stood just fine. And um, he actually ended up using the top two floors as his own offices. And that was part of how he convinced the city, saying, like, well, I have the furthest to fall and I'll be all right. It was a great success. Um, it's uh, often claimed as New York's first skyscraper. It was even claimed that back in, you see old New York Times articles, 1905, of the, eh, the city's first skyscraper gets sold to Standard Oil. Um, and it was a very popular design and it quickly got uh, copied again and again. Uh, throughout the city. And one of those copies is the Flatiron Building. So originally built in 1903, uh, 1931, sorry, 1903. Sorry, I've, I've got the uh, caption wrong there. And um, again, one of these challenging, very uh, narrow sites on a you know, triangular plot of land, very iconic building now. And so uh, again, allows it to, uh, you know, get some reasonable spans in there, nice open space, even though you've got a, a narrow plot of land. Uh, famously, you've got the Empire State Building, also in New York City, uh, really only popular with uh, structural steel uh, in, in the 30s because of uh, its high axial capacity uh, and, you know, because we can bring uh, pieces of steel up and down, it, it made a lot of sense given the crane work and the ability to um, get all of those pieces up and, and connect them up with rivets all the way up the building. Moving on to some more modern uh, cases of steel construction. So we have the Willis Towers, where um, I knew it as the Sears Tower growing up, which was for a long time the tallest building in the world. Um, it is constructed of, uh, you can see where uh, the different parts of the tower uh, sort of stop going up as they go. So there are essentially nine individual um, cores of the building, steel cores, and they're bundled up like tubes. And they stop them at different heights, one to help with 
vortex shedding, but then two, it's sort of strict, uh, tricking the building into uh, thinking that it's a, a wider at the base than it is at the top, which it, obviously it is, but that all sort of works together. So you're not having to take um, all of that weight in the foundations uh, if this was uh, all the way up, as well as you can sort of uh, effectively for that tallest part of the tower um, take advantage of a, a bigger, wider base. Uh, the image in the middle are the former World Trade Center towers, number one and number two. Um, again, these were steel constructed towers, uh, probably some of the tallest steel construction uh, ever done. Um, one of the challenges with steel is that as you go higher and higher, uh, your construction progress slows down because um, you have to wait for crane times. So uh, we showed a lot on buildings and, and skyscrapers and the ability to go up. Uh, the Cowboy Stadium in Dallas, Texas is a really good example of very long span. So this is one of the advantages of steel is it has a very good strength to weight ratio. And so it's, um, in, you know, for not much weight, it can, it's got high strength, high stiffness. And that means that for truss elements, uh, it's a very, very efficient use of, um, of material. And so you can get these very long spans. So you can see the main trusses there uh, going the entire length of the stadium. Uh, this roof actually retracts and allows in natural and lights in sunlight and open air stadium and they can close it back up um, and so really something could only be uh, achieved with uh, steel construction so that's with this with buildings um, have a quick look at some steel bridges so you've got the Manaya suspension bridge uh, in the UK so this is one of the world's first suspension bridges uh, you can see that the uh, suspension cables as far as the main cables um, there, so not the suspenders, are essentially just a series of plates which have been uh, riveted together. And so uh, while they're acting like a cable, they're just a, a bunch of steel plates. And yeah, I guess you can think about that makes some sense because um, it is, you know, it's all a tension member. It's all acting that same way. And this is pretty, um, uh, pretty impressive, built in 1826 and, you know, over 400 meters long. Um, on the right, we've got the uh, Sydney Harbor Bridge, a uh, very iconic, um, <clears throat> you know, steel uh, arch bridge uh, in Sydney in that beautiful harbor, uh, built in 1930. And then uh, at the bottom, you have the Golden Gate Bridge, uh, which was completed a, a year after the Sydney Harbor Bridge, very long span. Uh, one of the interesting things on the Golden Gate Bridge is that it was one of the first major construction projects in the United States to implement... Um, worker safety precautions and in fact they um, you know they had a net underneath the um, bridge deck it uh, saved something about 30 different uh, workers who fell and would have otherwise died um, in the construction so it was uh, not only a marvel of engineering marvel of uh, looking after uh, the, the people who are on uh, those construction projects so uh, that's just a, a very brief overview of some projects, uh, you know, again, mostly in the United States on the use of steel. Uh, let's bring it back to, you know, where we're based here in New Zealand, uh, some steel build, uh, steel construction in New Zealand, and some, uh, this is not going to be an exhaustive list or an exhaustive history, but I think there's a few nice uh, cases which show some use, um, and then also we can discuss uh, some of the way uh, maybe steel stopped being used quite so much, and and its eventual resurgence in the last few years. Um, so we'll start with some steel bridges. So we've got the Rakaia Gorge Bridge Number 1, which is built, uh, again, at the end of the 19th century in 1890. Uh, this is quite an interesting bridge. So uh, if you can see on the image on the left, so this, this goes through uh, a river gorge um, about an hour, hour and a half inland from Christchurch on the South Island. And um, it's a... Uh, I think it's a 180 foot uh, span <clears throat> in between there, so 50 odd meters. And you can see these sort of uh, zigzag bits. So each of these um, are essentially just uh, trusses um, or, or like suspender cables, uh, which go from each abutment uh, to each of these supports. And there's three of them, so you've got one, two, three, four spans uh, in between the uh, these sort of compression struts. Um, the kind of neat thing is you could send this to a, uh, a, a second year engineering student who's learned statics and 
that static student could analyze this bridge because each of these um, sort of truss elements is uh, statically determinant and, and true pin joints. Um, and this is technically a wrought iron bridge, um, but it's still you know, sort of early use of steel wrought iron uh, within New Zealand and, and quite a unique bridge. I hadn't really ever seen anything quite like it before. Um, and obviously one of the more uh, iconic bridges in New Zealand is the Auckland Harbour Bridge, uh, which looks like a uh, slightly smaller version of the Sydney Harbour Bridge built about 30 years later. Um, but again, this is uh, one of the main um, traffic routes within the city of Auckland. Uh, you can see some of the construction photos up there on the top left. Um, and then uh, several decades later, as uh, traffic between uh, the main center business dist central business district and the North Shore of the harbor increased, there was a need to increase the capacity um, of the bridge. And so you can see on the bottom image here, uh, these what look like steel box girders uh, on either side. And that's exactly what they are. They're what are termed these clip-ons, uh, which were included in order to add two additional lanes to the bridge outside the main uh, steel truss. And uh, one of the challenges with these is they are uh, quite flexible compared to the main truss structure of the bridge. And so because traffic is constantly going over them, uh, they're constantly vibrating and they have some fatigue issues and fatigue and steel uh, you can think about it like if you took a paper clip and you worked it back and forth uh, several times eventually it will snap in half uh, the same thing happens with large structural steel where we're talking hundreds of thousands or millions of cycles but if you've got you know tens of thousands of vehicles going across it every day you get those cycles pretty quick and that means that they do have a uh, constant inspection and maintenance in order to keep these clip-ons um, in good working condition. Um, and steel bridges tended to uh, stop getting used for uh, many bridges within uh, the country, mostly because of the proximity of most roadways in the country to the coast, and so you have a large, um, you know, corrosion potential, and that means that you know, the maintenance on them is much higher compared to, say, a concrete structure. However, we still do use steel bridges for, um, I say, some more iconic uh, and, and interesting bridges than sort of your typical, you know, few spans uh, just keep the road going over where there was a waterway. So a couple of those iconic ones that I've pulled out are the Lower Hatea Crossing in Whangarei, uh, up on the North Islands, about a few hours north of Auckland. Um, this is at the um, sort of where the river comes in. Uh, to the uh, port of Nfangare, and because there's a marina there and there's a need to get uh, sailboats in and out, uh, you can see the, uh, the part which sits up, that actually rotates back and you have a drawbridge, um, and you can sort of open and close. I know that they've had challenges given the intensity of the sun in New Zealand where it's been a very hot day for a long time. Uh, they've got trouble opening and then reshutting the bridge because of thermal expansion. Um, but again, it's, they've done some retrofit work on that and I've sort of solved that issue, but it's, uh, again, one of those interesting things around, uh, until you have this wonderful design and then, uh, you implement it and nature sort of throws something else at you. Um, and, you know, we have a similar sort of, uh, thing with the East Taupo Arterial Bridge, which is this beautiful, um, arch bridge with this, uh, cable net on there. Um, it's wonderful. It goes over the Waikato River. But one of the challenges with this bridge and why uh, it's a sort of a maintenance, ongoing maintenance thing they have to do is it is right smack in the middle of a geothermal field. And a geothermal field is a very uh, corrosive environment. So lots of steam, uh, lots of minerals coming up. And so a uh, big, beautiful bridge, uh, but they do, it does mean that they have to do uh, some additional work in order to help keep uh, the coating system, so the paints uh, in good working order. Um, but what is lovely is you can see just how big that span is, uh, which you, you wouldn't be able to get out of a pre-stressed concrete bridge. You'd have to put something in the middle of uh, the river. And so this keeps the river uh, nice and free flowing. And um, again, you end up with just this gorgeous bridge at the end of it. So that's with bridges in New Zealand. Uh, let's shift quickly to uh, buildings and, and the use of steel buildings in New Zealand. So... Uh, of folks of a certain generation, steel buildings are 
uh, synonymous with uh, the image on the left, which has been called Darth Vader's pencil case. Uh, so this is it's now called the Aeon Center, but it was when it was first constructed, it was called the BNZ Tower. And uh, as this was going on, uh, this was one of the last large steel construction projects in New Zealand. <clears throat> and one of the reasons why it stopped was there were worker disputes with the Boilermakers Union. Um, the project got shut down uh, and then rebid. Uh, there was a, a lot of political uh, toing and froing between the union and the government at the time. And um, the, you know, basically what's come out of that uh, was that steel construction got a bad name um, for being difficult to do and expensive, and then precast concrete also started becoming more popular in the 1980s, and essentially steel construction stopped for 20, 30 years in the country. And it wasn't until the Christchurch and Canterbury earthquakes in 2010 and 2011, uh, where there was a lot of damage to um, concrete buildings, and uh, really a public perception they didn't want to be in any concrete buildings anymore, as well as the fast erection time of uh, steel structures and the need to rebuild the central city, particularly the old unreinforced masonry buildings which had fallen down. Um, steel construction has really seen uh, a rise um, in the country here. And so you can see uh, the image on the right. This is some dormitories at the University of Canterbury, which I took some photos of, uh, which was one of dozens of steel buildings going up simultaneously uh, in the city of Christchurch, and that's now also the case uh, in the capital in Wellington, where almost every new building is a steel building. And so while it used to be almost entirely concrete construction, it's now uh, closer to 50-50, or maybe steel construction has actually eked out um, concrete in, in a few ways. And so <coughs> one of the few things that we want to look at is why is uh, steel sort of eking out concrete? And what makes it a good uh, construction material? And we will talk through uh, some of these things as we go through the rest of the course and the rest of the videos. But, you know, one of the big advantages now, particularly with the challenge of climate change, is that steel is predominantly a renewable resource. And I have renewable in quotes um, because, you know, it does take a lot of energy to make steel, uh, even if you are recycling it. And that's, you know, if you're using a mini mill, Essentially, instead of pulling out iron ore, uh, you're taking existing uh, steel and you're heating it up with a very, with a lot of electricity, uh, making it molten, and then uh, you can you know sort of reform it into steel. Um, in New Zealand, uh, they've shut down the mini mill here, and they do predominantly um, use of iron sands, uh, and so that has some additional complications, which are sort of unique to New Zealand, particularly the uh, high titanium oxide. Uh, content of those sands, which makes the processing a, a bit challenging, but even that one's sort of pseudo-renewable because um, those iron sands are coming from, uh, of course, erosion of the mountains um, upstream, and so by the time they've done enough uh, extraction of sand at one end of the beach, uh, there's been enough rainfall and, and erosion that, well, there's more iron sand down from where they started. Um, as I So that's on sort of the material and some of what's used for uh, why that makes it from a material standpoint good. Um, but really the, the big one is going to be the, the high strength to weight uh, efficiency. So that's why I said those really big long spans. Um, and, uh, you know, you can have for actual loaded members, so for in a truss or columns, uh, you can take a lot of load and a uh, reasonably small cross section. Um, and this good, um, you know, efficiency of strength to weight ratio means that it has a low seismic mass. So when it comes to earthquakes, uh, what we're always worried about is essentially Newton's um, second law of force equals mass times acceleration. Uh, we got to deal with that force. Um, sorry, Newton's third law. Um, we've got to deal with that force. And so that means that... Um, so what we're worried about is the fact that, you know, force equals mass times an acceleration. So um, if we, acceleration due to the earthquake isn't going to change, and if with force is the thing we're trying to resist, uh, if we can reduce the mass of the structure, it means that uh, we're going to see less forces going through there. It's going to be an, you know, an easier design, uh, or design more likely to uh, be resilient in an earthquake. Uh, one of the other big um, 
uh, advantages are really around the construction. So because so much of it can be fabricated uh, in a shop, in a, in a big workshop factory uh, setting off-site, um, you have a lot better quality control, and it means that you can set up your connections so that they just uh, sort of clip into place. And so if you've ever watched uh, steel building get constructed, you see it goes up very quickly. Um, and so it's that fast erection time and ability to get really good tolerances on that. But, you know, one of the main reasons why steel is used is it's just a really cool material and you can do some really wonderful things with it. So I've got just a few examples of um, some pretty special uh, steel structures. So the Gateshead Millennium Bridge, which we're seeing uh, tilting there to allow for uh, river transport. Um, the Tokyo International Forum and the National Botanical Gardens of Wales are these big rolled steel forms. So you get this sort of arching action just even out of um, uh, normal steel sections. And then, of course, the Guggenheim Museum in Bilbao, Spain, or uh, the Disney Concert Hall, also done by Frank Gehry, uh, which are these big sort of steel um, truss, you know, brace grids where they're, they're all stacked together. And um, you come up with these just really gorgeous... Um, uh, structures where, you know, you could build them out of concrete too, but they wouldn't have that same uh, sort of lightness to them that you get out of steel. So uh, with that, I'd like to thank you for watching.